Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Monday, June 22nd, 2020. Fortunately, the peace was maintained in Tulsa, despite the invasion of Trump and a low turnout crowd of his MAGA maniacs. So the mob rally was clearly a big disappointment to the Donald. The estimate is that 6,200 people came (laughs) nowhere near close to filling up a 19,000-seat Bank of Oklahoma arena in downtown Tulsa. And there is this priceless footage of Trump as he returned to the White House later Saturday night, appearing quite dejected and deflated. And it's always uh, risky to try to predict a turning point. And he certainly may bounce back because he knows no bottom. But I take some heart in the low turnout. And with the TikTok teens who ordered up thousands of tickets to the event, never intending to show. And the other elements that I'll cite here in a moment. This could be the point where Trump starts to see the beginning of an end. But as I caution, he uh, is a, a guy who will fight, and he fights well below the belt. And I spent about an hour Saturday night watching him deliver his performance. You can't really call it a speech. And I was stunned that at one point he left his text, and the prepared text was just loaded with attack lines on Democrats who are all looters and mobs and thugs and uh, lovers of China and Iran. And his whimpering about being a victim of the media. And about the coronavirus, which is some sort of an international plot to end Trump's political career. But he went off into a (laughs) 14-minute diversion, responding to media accounts from exactly a week before when he gave the commencement speech at West Point. And I didn't make any remarks about this. I read the coverage. I saw the video of him uh, tiptoeing down a ramp that had no railing. And at one point he took a drink and he raised the glass with his left hand and then used his right hand to steady it. Immediately people pounced and said, oh, this is uh, some sort of uh, motor skills loss. People started to suggest Parkinson's disease. And frankly, I, I think that was overblown speculation. And as he told in this 14-minute diversion from his uh, attack lines on Saturday night in Tulsa, he called uh, Mrs. Trump. Melania told him, you're trending on Twitter. And he said, oh, did they love my speech at West Point? She said, no, they think you have Parkinson's. (laughs) But he is so thin-skinned that he had to spend all this time explaining how You know, the water thing was because he had this really expensive tie that goes down to his balls, and he didn't want to damage the tie. And then about the ramp, he said, well, I had on leather-bottom shoes, and there was the general with his, you know, rough-and-ready rubber soles, and uh, it was slippery like an ice skating rink. I mean, all this stuff, and it's just bizarre, and it is uh, this disclosure of how his mind doesn't really work. He can't concentrate on the task before him, which is to rouse the rabble, feed the mob, pander to the base, lie repeatedly. (laughs) And 14 minutes he took to talk about this one incident at West Point. And I think that is really telling about what goes on 
under that uh, orange mop on top of his head. And it is disturbing. And it, it you know, <laughs> affirms what John Bolton has discussed and disclosed in his new tell-all book. And this man truly is unfit for office. He's not really a mature human being. He suffers, I believe, from uh, arrested development, his childhood narcissism, still really what drives him. And it's what, you know, caused the whole debacle in Tulsa that he had to get his narcissism fed by a friendly crowd that would respond to the lines that they've always responded to. And the speech went on and on, and I decided to go to sleep on Saturday night instead of stay up for the whole thing. But it was just this laundry list of his peeves, his name-calling, his bad boy behavior. He revels in being unpresidential, he had to use the line about China virus. His press secretary, this uh, McEnany girl, was, uh, sorry, woman, uh, was defending him today. China virus, Kung flu. At one point, he got a standing O from the smallish crowd for saying, you're lucky that I'm your president. Just such a bizarre parade. And even though Sean Penn doesn't really look like uh, Trump that much, I see a future role because Sean Penn, his greatest skill is depicting sick, twisted, effed up people. And that's what we saw on full display in performance art on Saturday night in Tulsa. And so we've learned a little bit about some of the concern inside the White House, the campaign officials and his advisors acknowledged to one another that Trump had not been able to will public opinion away from fears about the spread of coronavirus in an indoor space, they conceded that myriad polls showing Trump's eroded standing are not fake and that he might be on course to lose to Biden in November. So here's Kaylee McEnany at her briefing today, boasting that 7.7 .7 million people watched the Tulsa rally on Fox News. Well, one of those was me, so don't get too excited about that. <laughs> And they're bragging that some, you know, three or four million people watched it online. I'm not saying that Trump has been deserted by his base. But there are at least people who made the calculation that it was going to be too crowded because they'd been told that a million people had applied for tickets and there was this setup for an overflow crowd that never materialized. Because of Juneteenth, maybe a lot of white people wisely said this racist guy who I support might lead to a street brawl and I don't want to get wrapped up in that. So there are a lot of reasons people may have avoided the rally, but they're still willing to vote for Trump. So McEnany was asked if Trump regrets using the racist phrase Kung Flu. She said the president never regrets putting the onus back on China. Another reporter noted that earlier this year, Kellyanne Conway described the phrase Kung Flu as offensive and wrong. And asked repeatedly whether the White House disagrees with Kellyanne, McEnany ignored the question and called on somebody from the friendly One America News Network. The other takeaway is that Trump made a comment about how he told his people to slow down on testing people for coronavirus. And they're trying to explain that away as, a, as something he said in jest. Peter Navarro was on the Sunday Blather shows. 
saying, you know, that was just a joke. Well, it's not a joke. Trump first introduced this idea of suppressing numbers by avoiding testing people back in January when the Grand Princess was languishing off the coast of San Francisco. And he didn't want them to come ashore because the numbers were going to go up and make him look bad. And he's always obsessed about the numbers. And as we'll get to in a moment, there is a serious issue being raised now by the Democrats that the money that's been appropriated for testing has not been spent. So the arduous efforts of his defenders to try to interpret (laughs) the misstatements of this stable genius are impressive or just desperate. So about this TikTok thing and the K-pop fans, I first learned about this on Sunday morning, and it appears that they did have an impact. And uh, a lot of this stuff is beyond my own uh, technology knowledge. I have looked at TikTok once. I I know what goes on there. It's these 10 or 12 second videos and people dance and they make a simple statement. It's it's, uh, like a tweet with motion. And a woman named Mary Jo Laup takes credit for starting this because she went on Twitter on June 11th. And she said that, uh, you know, what would happen if we all reserve tickets and don't show up and leave him standing there alone on the stage? Now, her statement has been seen more than two million times. So uh, that does suggest that it went viral. And what we don't know is exactly how many tickets were reserved by these uh, described as teenage activists. But Brad Parscale, the campaign manager for Trump, apparently took the bait because he was the one who was bragging that they'd had a million requests, they needed this overflow, they talked about uh, renting a convention center nearby, nearby for overflow. They had installed a podium and a jumbotron screen outside of the BOK arena. And one of the people that Trump uh, got a rise out of his crowd from, he he mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez as he was vilifying all Democrats as socialists and, you know, uh, anti-law and order, pro-Iran, pro-China, as I mentioned. So AOC tweeted, Actually, you just got rocked by teens on TikTok who flooded the Trump campaign with fake ticket reservations and tricked you into believing a million people wanted your white supremacist open mic enough to pack an arena during COVID. K-pop allies, we see and appreciate your contributions in the fight for justice, too. So in an analytical piece at the Washington Post, uh, this is Travis Andrews, the reporter. He said the common refrain shifted from TikTokers and K-pop fans lead Trump to overestimate his crowd to TikTokers and K-pop fans are the reason fewer than 6,200 people showed up to the event. And he says the former assertion is almost certainly true to some degree, But the latter is not only unlikely, but probably false. Well, a lot of these things are pretty amorphous and uh, hard to pin down. But I think there was some impact. So while I was watching Trump's uh, stand-up act on Saturday night, Kathy popped into the family room, or I guess it was actually the pre-show coverage we were watching, And in the arena, they were playing a great Tom Petty song, I Won't Back Down. And I've used that as an intro to podcasts and as a statement of uh, resistance. And Kathy said, "Uh, does Tom Petty approve of Trump using his song? And I said, well, you know, Tom's dead. But uh, in general, you cannot block the public performance of a song that is... uh, you know, uh, licensed by ASCAP and BMI. And the performance is owned by the holder here of the rights, and that would be the Petty Estate. 
Nevertheless, the family, Adria, Anna Kim, Dana, and Jane Petty, said that the U.S. president is in no way authorized to use this song to further a campaign that leaves too many Americans and common sense left behind. They said that Tom firmly stood against racism and discrimination of any kind. He would not want a song of his used for a campaign of hate. He liked to bring people together. Now, Neil Young has fought back for the use of uh, 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 rockin' in the free world. The Rolling Stones have complained about his use of you can't always get what you want. But the bottom line is that it's a long shot to uh, win a battle like this with anybody. Uh, If you pay the royalties, you get to play the tune. So one of the other reasons that Trump was in hot water over the weekend, but I doubt if it affected anybody who was considering going to Tulsa, is that late Friday night, Trump's personal lawyer and a guy who acts like attorney general, Bill Barr, engineered the ouster of Jeffrey Berman, who is the top prosecutor, the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, where Michael Cohen was convicted, where Rudy Giuliani is currently being investigated, where Lev Parnas and uh, that other guy (laughs) uh, are being prosecuted. And what is so weird is the way this played out was bungled by Barr because he simply, he he met with Berman sometime on Friday afternoon. They ended up uh, not agreeing. And then the Justice Department announced that uh, Berman was stepping down as U.S. attorney. Berman then went to Twitter and said, uh, I am not stepping down that I will be here until a replacement is confirmed by the Senate. And the strangeness of the timing, because you're probably aware that one of the revelations in Bolton's book is that Trump had promised the hardline president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, back in 2018, that he would replace the U.S. attorney in the Southern District and then move to drop the charges against a Turkish banker who was accused of violating sanctions against Iran. So with that public, Barr seems to be really brazen in willing to fulfill an illicit promise by his president to an authoritarian foreign leader. So... Here's a little detail from the Wall Street Journal. The day before, Bill Barr abruptly announced plans to replace Berman. Supervisors in Barr's Justice Department asked Berman to sign a letter criticizing Mayor de Blasio of New York for the city's enforcement of social distancing rules to block religious gatherings, but not recent street protests. Berman refused to sign the letter after engaging in a brief back-and-forth effort to edit it. He voiced strong objections to the letter, particularly its assertions that de Blasio imposed a double standard. He described the letter as a political stunt that would strain relations between his his office and the city. The letter, uh, we're told, has not yet been sent. Now, one of the other factors that surfaces here came to me in an email this morning, and I just want to detail it for you, and you can decide if you think this is legit. But it came from a group called uh, Friends of Jeffrey. The return email address is Jeffrey S. Berman at... And it came to the public comment uh, form at peterbcollins.com. It opens, It is time that the truth be told. About two weeks ago, Sue Curtin a senior Securities and Exchange Commission attorney from the Boston office, filed an FBI criminal complaint, which alleges that for the past three years, Jay Clayton, the SEC chairman, who Trump had announced uh, he would replace Berman with, had prevented her, Sue Curtin, from acting on a whistleblower investigation she was in charge of. And that uncovered evidence that the Puerto Rico municipal bond bankruptcy was caused by massive securities fraud. It appeared that the three major credit agencies knowingly issued fraudulent bond ratings 
on the muni bonds and that a number of major banks then knowingly sold those worthless bonds to their customers. And two weeks ago, Curtin filed a formal FBI criminal complaint alleging that Jay Clayton and Republican senators pressured her to drop the case. She claims the whistleblower submitted evidence that these officials received substantial political contributions from the rating agencies and banks to cover up the fraud and kill the investigation. After Berman became aware of this about 10 days ago, he formally requested that the criminal complaint be handled by his office, New York's Southern District. A few days later, Attorney General Barr called to tell him he was fired. Barr claimed he was fired for sharing information about the criminal complaint with Tom Perez, the chair of the Democratic National Committee. So that's a murky subplot, and we'll have to see if that surfaces in any of the mainstream coverage or in any follow-up action, because one of the deals that uh, shook out of this is that when Berman refused to step down, then Barr upped the ante and got Trump to issue a termination notice. He fired him. But that means that Jay, what's his name? (laughs) The uh, SEC guy. Uh, What is his name here? I've got it. Jay Clayton will not be the acting... U.S. attorney in the Southern District, and neither will a guy from uh, New Jersey, Craig Carpinetto. Carpen, Carpinetto, thank you. Uh, he was supposed to step in as the acting head, but because Barr fired Berman, they have to promote the number two in the office to acting U.S. attorney, and she is 72-year-old Audrey Strauss. And she is known as a tough cookie who often stays in the background but is very much in the foreground when it comes to prosecuting people she considers to be criminals. So this means, at least at the moment, we take it to mean that Berman's work will continue related to good old Rudy, the Ukraine scams that uh, he's been working. And uh, there's also the Trump tax return case, which will be decided by the Supreme Court in the next few weeks. And that was uh, led, at least in part, by the Southern District uh, Prosecutor's Office. And I have my issues with James Risen, the former New York Times Pulitzer Prize winner, who now writes over at The Intercept. But on this one, I don't disagree. He says the corruption and politicization of the Department of Justice under Bill Barr is now complete. Under Barr, DOJ has two objectives, to suppress any investigation of Trump and his associates and to aggressively pursue investigations of his political rivals. He has turned the Justice Department into a law firm with one client, Donald Trump, and Barr doesn't even hide his intentions any longer. And he recites what I told you, that Trump agreed to fire Jeffrey Berman and install Jay Clayton, a Trump golfing buddy, with no experience as a prosecutor. But, writes Risen, Berman refused to go quietly. He quickly saw Barr's move for exactly what it was, a raw attempt to shut down ongoing Trump-related investigations. While the standoff continued into Saturday, Barr's actions sparked outrage among legal professionals and political leaders. And interestingly, uh, Democrats like uh, Mark Warner, senator from Virginia, said Bill Barr was hired to personally protect the president. And then Lindsey Graham, who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, said that uh, they, in this process, in order to basically prevent Clayton from being confirmed that he would return to the longstanding tradition that the two senators from New York would have to approve the nominee. Now, this has been sidelined by Mitch McConnell, and a number of court appointments have not been vetted or approved by the two senators from the state 
in which the appointee resides or the location of the court to which that person is being appointed. That's a very unusual move by Graham, who's been quite the toady to Trump. So a couple more tidbits uh, surfacing from Belches from John Bolton. Bolton says that Trump compared his courtship of Kim Jong-un to dating and always wanted to be the one who broke up with the girl first. And Bolton also pledged that as a conservative Republican, he fears a second Trump term, even to the point of saying that he might appoint uh, Democrats to the Supreme Court. (laughs) I think that's pretty far-fetched. But he says, I will not be voting for Trump. I won't be voting for Biden. I'm planning to write in the name of a conservative Republican. And he hasn't figured out who it is yet. But he does warn that the second uh, Trump term would be worse than the first. He said, speaking as a conservative Republican, the concern I have is that once the election is over, if Trump wins, the political constraint is gone. And because he has no philosophical grounding... There's no telling what will happen in a second term. Once he's free of any re-election pressure, it's going to be revealed that he's not a conservative. And he says that's one reason he wrote the book. Most important, he says, will Trump's current China pose last beyond Election Day? The Trump presidency is not grounded in philosophy, grand strategy, or policy. It's grounded in Trump. And then his bizarre fantasy... Let's imagine he's re-elected and a member of the liberal side of the court leaves. I could imagine advisors that he has now saying, you know, you nominated two wonderful conservative justices in your first term. Now think of your legacy. Think of the balance of the court. Nominate equally competent liberal justices. Well, I'm sorry. That's just total BS. And it was interesting. One of the points where the Trump mob booed on Saturday night was when Trump bragged about winning confirmation for Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. And he glossed over the setback that Gorsuch dealt him on the rights of gay and transgender people in the workplace in the uh, decision that broke a week ago today. Also, Trump has made some comments starting in an interview on Friday that he had to walk back today. He said that uh, Nicolas Maduro, who is described in this Washington Post account as a dictator, who has clung to power since a disputed 2018 election, well, Trump has said that Maduro's asked to meet with him and that uh, he would be inclined to do so. He said he doesn't mind meeting with people. Well, that's a very selective statement on his part. He won't meet with anybody related to Iran. And he basically likes to meet with (laughs) dictators who he seems to uh, consider himself a peer of. So today he said, unlike the radical left, I will always stand against socialism and with the people of Venezuela. My administration always stood on the side of freedom and liberty and against the oppressive Maduro regime. I would only meet with Maduro to discuss one thing, a peaceful exit from power. But another Bolton revelation is that Trump has said that, uh, you know, recognizing opposition leader Juan Guaido, which was upon advice of Bolton and Elliot Abrams, he was asked if that was a mistake, and he said, "Eh, nah, nah, I don't know. But get this, this leads to the Democrats piling on, supporting regime change and Guaido in Venezuela. Here's Joe Biden. Trump talks tough on Venezuela but admires thugs and dictators like Nicolas Maduro. As president, I will stand with the Venezuelan people and for democracy. Well, as I've argued repeatedly, there's never been any evidence that the 2018 election of Maduro was illegitimate. They simply call it that and say that's the basis to overthrow him. And here's Donna Shalala, 
She's in her first term in Congress as a Democrat from Florida, former HHS secretary in the Bill Clinton administration. She said Trump's comment is a sad day for the Venezuelan people, democracy, and American leadership, and reaffirmed that she stands with Juan Guaido and the people of Venezuela. Guaido has no legitimacy whatsoever. And to see Democrats embrace a regime change agenda and try to claim that Trump is light on that? Pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. Well, I want to preface this next item by saying it comes from a new book by a discredited journalist. And it quotes comments from the discredited author of the infamous Steele dossier. So the author of the new book, Shadow State, Murder, Mayhem, and Russia's Remaking the West, is one Luke Harding. And he has been promoting Russiagate relentlessly. He, of course, is the one who falsely claimed that Paul Manafort met with Julian Assange at the Embassy of Ecuador twice. And in this new book, related to Parliament, British Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee investigation into Kremlin infiltration into British politics, that Theresa May and her successor as Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who was her foreign secretary, ignored what Christopher Steele says is the Kremlin's likely hold over President Trump and his family-slash-administration and indications of Russian interference in and clandestine funding of the Brexit referendum. And so I do agree that there is strange chemistry between Trump and Putin. He does defer to him. He wants to be buddies. But at the same time, Trump has not been that friendly to Russia on a policy basis. And if he were, as they suggest here, under some spell from Putin, I think things would be very different. And Trump wouldn't have dropped out of the, uh, what, the intermediate range treaty with Russia. And there are a number of other issues where, you know, he'll say that he was really tough on Russia But it's fair to say that he was not operating from, you know, some uh, obsequious point of view. Also, there is some unity among the European members who supported the United States and Russia and China in the six or seven party nuclear deal with Iran that was the centerpiece of the Obama administration and State John Kerry. And after the U.S. breached the agreement, almost two years ago now, Iran has made moves that are seen as alarming at the International Atomic Energy Agency, and thus the Europeans signed on to a resolution expressing serious concern that Iran had refused to allow inspectors into two locations and was unwilling to answer questions about its possible undeclared nuclear material and nuclear-related activities. And my view of this is that Iran is using ambiguity and these kinds of moves to force the European nations to take sides here. And if you want an Iranian nuclear deal, you've got to muscle the United States back into it because the sanctions that the U.S. has reimposed on Iran are crippling the economy and making life very difficult. So while this is spun as really dark and nefarious on the part of Iran, I still cling to the reporting of Gareth Porter, which indicates that since the early 2000s, Iran has not been pursuing a nuclear weapon under orders from the Ayatollah because he doesn't want to be a nuclear power. As you know, we have funding in the Peter B. Collins Podcast Community Fund. We're offering $100 grants to 
people who listen to this podcast or know someone who does and who could use $100 to get through these tough times. So here is listener Tanya Blattner. Hello, Peter. I'm a single mother living in the high Mojave Desert trying to survive this pandemic. I've been listening to your podcast about six months and recently heard about the $100 grants for folks struggling to make ends meet. Well, here I am, and I'm very grateful for any help I might get. It's been rough since the pandemic hit, not being able to do the cleaning jobs I normally do. And uh, she doesn't use PayPal. She included her address. So, uh, Tanya, I am going to send you a $100 check later today, and I hope it helps you uh, buy some groceries or what you need most uh, at this difficult time. And here is Megan Knight. She writes, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I've been out of work the past few months and really need help. I'm co- really hoping. Thank you so much. And uh, I did learn that she is in the Los Angeles area, and uh, I'll be sending her a check for $100 later today. If you're in need, don't be shy. Drop an email at peterbcollins.com. We'd like to help. So nine days after the New York Police Department was ordered by the city council to ban chokeholds, an officer with a really checkered history got in a scuffle out at Rockaway Beach. Rockaway is beautiful. We visited some friends there last uh, summer when we were in New York. And the description of the encounter is that two loud men who appeared to be uh, Intoxicated, as a total of three of them. And the man who was choke-holded, if that's a proper term, his name is Ricky Bell, five-year-old black man. He had mental illness. And he was reportedly taunting the police officers, and twice he asked them if they are scared, presumably by him. And in a video captured, the author, identified as David Afanador, rushes in, tackles Ricky Bellevue, and he presses his forearm into Bellevue's neck for 10 seconds. Bystanders yell that he is being choked. Now, Ricky Bellevue survived this encounter, made it to the hospital, where he later said that it was uh, pretty, pretty, and that uh, he was unable to breathe, extent that he couldn't even say, I can't breathe. So I want to credit Alan McLeod over at Mint Press News, because just like he was the first to publish the details on Derek Chauvin, the killer cop from Minneapolis and ugly record, well, Alan McLeod is already on to Afanador. In 2014, he faced up to seven years in prison for the of a black teenager, in addition to official misconduct and gun charges. Video of the incident shows a Fanador drawing a teen who had his hands up, using it to smash his teeth in. A Fanador and his partner continue to attack him as he's lying dazed on the ground, punching and slapping his face. And he and his partner were found innocent of all that matter. Then, 2008, a Fanador was part of a group of officers performing a strip search on a man in the street. A shocked bystander, Williams, began to record the event, ask for their names and numbers. Officers immediately assaulted him, punching and slapping him in the head, stealing his phone. They handcuffed Williams, lifting him by the cuffs, causing excessive pain, and continued to punch in the face and assault him while... So, a fan of door then started a malicious prosecution against Williams, and the city of New York paid... $37,500 in a settlement of that case. A year later, a Fanador was part of a group of cops who arrested and brutalized George Smith for no reason, breaking his collarbone and refusing to get him medical treatment. In 2015, a Fanador was allegedly part of a group of three plainclothes officers who illegally entered a Brooklyn house and assaulted an African-American woman. When her sister tried to intervene, they shouted, Shut the fuck up, you black bitch, and arrested her too ransacking the house while putting a gun to their heads. Wow. And is there more? (laughs) Uh, 
I guess that's all that uh, was found so far. But Alan McLeod at Mint Press News is an impressive reporter, uh, and he gets information very quickly after incidents like this occur. Well, over the weekend, there were two protester-on-protester shootings, reportedly, at the scene of what is called CHOP now. It was CHAZ, the Capitol Hill uh, Autonomous Zone, and now it's called the uh, Capitol Hill Organized Protest. Early Saturday morning, shootings left a 19-year-old man dead and another in critical condition. And then another night of gunfire occurred on Sunday sent a person to the hospital with injuries. So this is disappointing. Also in Atlanta, I saw footage uh, on Twitter of armed black men who were apparently some sort of security detail, and shots rang out. It's not clear who the shooters were, but it did not appear that they came from the police or any kind of white vigilantes. We also have the scene at Talladega, where Bubba Wallace, the only black NASCAR uh, top driver, his garage in the pits or wherever it's located there at Talladega, well, they have video cameras there, so whoever planted the noose in his garage is likely to be discovered, but that's an ugly episode from over the weekend. Also, to be fair, I need to report that 106 people were shot, 14 killed in a weekend of violence in Chicago. And there was a shooting at a Minneapolis nightclub. Both shooting victims are in their 20s. One dead and one killed. And I don't have any further details on any uh, racial motives in that shooting in Minneapolis. And in Minneapolis, when Derek Chauvin was sent to to, uh, the county jail, the superintendent of the Ramsey County Jail in St. Paul intervened and kept black correctional officers from having direct contact with the former cop. So we have a complaint brought forward by eight Officers, half of whom are black, all are people of color. They said the orders from the white superintendent, Steve Lydon, amounted to segregation, indicated that he thought they could not be trusted to do their jobs because they're not white. After initially denying the, that the officer's contact with Chauvin had been determined by race, a spokesman acknowledged the move, said Lydon has been removed from the job temporarily. Lydon said he had decided to keep non-white employees away from Chauvin because he believed having people of color interact with him could have heightened ongoing trauma. He said he reversed himself and apologized after 45 minutes. And I'm not uh, defending Lydon in any way, but let's be honest. Prisons all across the United States are highly segregated institutions. And when it comes to time on the exercise yard. They separate black and Latinos. They separate by gang affiliation. And this goes on day in and day out. So I, I for me, this is not so shocking, but it is uh, worth criticizing. And we've learned about the fate of one of the black men found hanging in Southern California. The family of Malcolm Harsh, the 38-year-old homeless man who was found hanging, suspended from a tree near Victorville's library. Well, he did take his own life, the family said, after viewing video evidence. And that is... uh, different because they had suspected that foul play was involved. On Friday, I reported to you that in 15 different cities, the FBI and or Homeland Security were flying surveillance aircraft. And now BuzzFeed is reporting 
that the FBI deployed its most advanced spy plane, which is a pretty fancy Cessna Citation jet. And it is able to use high-tech surveillance from high altitudes. So it flew at 13 to 15,000 feet over the District of Columbia during the street protests there. And the one thing we can suspect is that at that altitude, that the cell phone simulators, dirt box, and stingray uh, are not effective because the, it's just too far up to intercept all those signals and operate. So an ACLU attorney says it's now been well documented that a number of federal agencies wildly overreacted to protests in D.C. to learn that the FBI deployed its state-of-the-art surveillance plane to watch these historic protests raises additional troubling questions. And BuzzFeed reports the FBI has a fleet of more than 120 surveillance aircraft covertly registered to fictitious companies. And I'll just note that in my one uh, tour of jury duty, where the accused had evaded the highway patrol here in California, I was impressed with how much video footage they had from a helicopter, from a fixed-wing airplane, from a body camera, dashboard cameras, fixed surveillance cameras. Virtually all the evidence we saw was on a video screen. So, in some ways, is this, again, is not that surprising, just alarming. <laughs> Here's today's COVID-19 update prepared by Linda Lewis. Worldwide, we have confirmed cases of almost 9 million. Total deaths reported almost 469,000, with 4.45 million recoveries. That's a new figure. Here in the United States... 2.2 million cases reported. Total deaths attributed to the coronavirus, 100, well, it's almost 120,000. And total recoveries, 622,000, out of total testing now of 27 million. And she opens with this report from David Dan, a reporter I respect. He's at the American Prospect. And he notes that... Uh, while we've seen this big jump in cases, uh, positive testing, that we are not seeing an equivalent spike in deaths. He said deaths are a lagging inf indicator. You catch the virus, you get sick, and for some that sickness progressively worsens and then you die. But cases started to rise in uh, now 22 states as recently as four weeks ago, and we should be seeing a higher number of deaths, but we have not. And there is some indication that positive tests are clustering around younger people. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis said the median age for new cases in thir is 37. And in Texas, Greg Abbott, the governor, said a majority of new cases are people under 30. Now, many millennials and uh, even younger believe that they're invincible, that they won't even, you know, test positive. And so this is of some concern because they can become carriers who infect older people like me and even more vulnerable people. And quoting day and again, we know a lot more about this disease from a medical standpoint, uh, standpoint than we did 100 days ago. There are more treatments that seem to work. Uh, dexamethasone appears to reduce death in seriously ill patients. An osteoporosis drug is showing some promise. We know that intubation is not necessary in all patients with low oxygen levels. And so we may be getting better at preserving the lives of people who do become seriously ill. Next, Linda reports on some moves in Europe to establish kind of local or regional travel bubbles. Agreements between countries allowing citizens to cross borders without having to quarantine. And because Europe is so condensed and the borders are uh, really so close and under the European Union, uh, they weren't uh, really controlling borders for many years. The first arrangement like this started in May with Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. 
A similar bubble is being discussed between Australia and New Zealand and among France, Germany, and Austria. And Linda notes, in such a world, a country with a persistent high level of infections, ours, for example, would be subjected to social travel and economic restriction, uh, restrictions that could devastate efforts to restore the economy and could undermine national security. Arizona, she describes as a poster child for dysfunctional public health communication because the governor there has been reluctant to allow local officials to announce a requirement for people to wear face masks. And this is how, you know, at the same time that cases have climbed past 52,000, hospitalizations have uh, reached their highest level since April 8th. The uh, ICU beds in Arizona are near full capacity, 85% in use, and that's the highest since March 26th. Arizona's daily case count of 2,500 yesterday was five times higher than the 497 new cases reported on May 16th. So the Republican governor, Doug Ducey, appears to be concerned that Trump has another mob rally, this one uh, uh, described as being held with younger people, uh, set up for the near future. I think it's next weekend. Yeah, a week before Trump is expected to come to Arizona for a major campaign rally, the Republican governor is continuing to resist calls to make mask wearing required in public places statewide. Now, here's the story about testing funds that I referred to earlier in Trump's comment at the Tulsa mob rally. In a letter sent Sunday to HHS Secretary Alex Azar, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York and Patty Murray of Washington observed that the Trump administration has been sitting on nearly $14 billion in funding that Congress passed for coronavirus testing and contract contact tracing. We call on you to immediately disperse the remainder of the $25 billion in funds to ramp up testing, as well as to make sure providers are aware of and able to easily access the $2 billion that Congress appropriated to provide testing for the uninsured. And finally today, Linda recommends, and I do too because I watched uh, John Oliver's HBO show on Sunday evening. He did a great job of uh, defining the crisis in America's prisons. And I've told you how the caseload keeps doubling down the road from me at San Quentin. But this is a national phenomenon. It is prisons and nursing homes where the largest uh, number of identified cases is. And this is leading to deep concerns. And Oliver, he ran a video that uh, was sent to him by a prisoner. And that prisoner has been in solitary confinement ever since. But they describe the situation in these tiny cells that are packed with uh, two bunks, four people. There's barely room to move past a person in the limited, you can't call it a hallway, but just the space between the wall and the bunks. And in California at Lompoc, that's near Santa Barbara, the federal correction complex, has had a 1,000 inmates test positive in one of the largest COVID-19 outbreaks. And in addition, there are 445,000 non-inmate personnel, guards and other prison employees, who have reported over 9,000 coronavirus cases. But there are a lot of people who can turn a blind eye, who just say, well, you know, if you're doing time, you get what you asked for. And John Oliver made a strong case The fact is we should be depopulating prisons and jails as quickly as we can right now. He pushed back on the traditional axiom that you should never do the crime if you can't do the time. He said under America's current criminal justice system, you're never just being sentenced to time. You're being sentenced to a lifetime of social stigma, futile job interviews, roadblocks to necessities like housing. All of that is immoral enough. There's frankly no reason whatsoever we should also now be sentencing people to die from a virus. Pretty uh, pretty woke for a British guy, wouldn't you say? Organizers of the protests in South Carolina are postponing future events 
and urging participants in past uh, gatherings to get tested for the virus after several people involved learned that they had been infected. Now, I still find it remarkable that despite the fact that millions of people repeatedly took to the streets in recent weeks, and we're seeing really just a smattering of cases related to those potential exposures. I'm happy about that. It's not like I wish that either people at Trump's rally or people who've been at Black Lives Matter protests uh, uh, get sick. But it has been something I've been very concerned about. I credit the New York Times for a front page Sunday article depicting the plight of people who've been booted out of nursing homes. And it was the perverse incentive of federal funding where these nursing homes could kick out a patient who, you know, was only earning them, say, $100 a day and bring in a COVID-19 patient who would get Medicare uh, funding worth at least $600 a day more. And so they tell the story of an 88-year-old man booted out of a nursing home in Los Angeles. He's got dementia. They dropped him off at a boarding house, and his family can't find him now. This ugly phenomenon is not limited to California. In Connecticut, a nursing home resident was told he had less than a week to pack his things and move to a homeless shelter. In Philadelphia, a nursing home planned to discharge a resident with schizophrenia to the city's Office of Homeless Services, which was closed because of the pandemic. In New York City, the epicenter of the pandemic, nursing homes tried to discharge at least 27 residents to homeless shelters from February through May. It's just amazing how for-profit health care institutions can declare somebody disposable because, well, they can feed their greed to a greater extent by taking a different patient. Well, I want to commend Jason Leopold over at BuzzFeed News. The Freedom of Information Act activist has done it again. And he even gets credit in the write-up of this particular episode in the New York Times. It relates to the Mueller report and previously redacted pages related to Roger Stone and his efforts to basically be the middleman between WikiLeaks and the Trump campaign in 2016. And it's interesting because the judge who forced the release of the unredacted documents is Reggie Walton, who's based in the District of Columbia. And when was it, 2005, 2006? Jason Leopold reported that Judge Walton's court had indicted Carl Rove in the Scooter Libby case. And it was never proven to be a false report. They just could not find any further evidence, and Rove was never formally and publicly indicted. But it's interesting that Walton has uh, ruled in favor of Leopold to release these documents. And what is fascinating to me, as you know, I have read very carefully the Mueller report, And I've also followed very carefully the trial of Roger Stone. And I have yet to find evidence that Roger Stone was in direct contact with WikiLeaks at any time during the 2016 campaign. And because Stone is a compulsive and uh, consistent liar, we have to discount the belief by Paul Manafort and other people at the top of the Trump campaign that Roger Stone was telling the truth when he said that he knew that WikiLeaks would be publishing documents in a matter of days. Because when you put it on a timeline, you see that Julian Assange had publicly stated that he had documents coming that would be bad for Hillary Clinton. And so it's quite possible that Stone was taking public information and claiming that he got it through a private channel. And in the articles, they're all very careful to say that uh, 
Stone. Well, let me read this quote. The new revelations are the strongest indication to date that Trump and his closest advisors were aware of outside efforts to hurt Clinton's electoral chances and that Stone played a direct role in communicating that situation to the Trump campaign. So this is the strongest indication to date, but it's not proven. So here's another uh, quote. Mueller's report concluded it had established that the Trump campaign displayed interest in WikiLeaks releases and that Roger Stone was in contact with the campaign about these releases, quote, claiming advanced knowledge of more to come. So it's a claim. <laughs> it's not an assertion. It is not a proven statement. And so I think I've linked to this report. So you can uh, read it yourselves. Here's another. This is in the voice of the special counsel's report. Quote, Trump knew that Manafort and Gates had asked Stone to find, find out what other damaging information about Clinton that WikiLeaks possessed. And Stone's claimed connection to WikiLeaks was common knowledge within the campaign. Again, claimed connection. And this is where I am still looking for evidence that there was direct communication that has been proven by evidence of any sort. Well, Trump is still railing, and he shifted into an even higher gear about the threat posed to his political future if millions of people vote by mail. His latest tweet today, rigged 20, oh, it's all caps, rigged 2020 election, millions of mail-in ballots will be printed by foreign countries and others. It will be the scandal of our times. Now, this is just extreme fantasy, because in any given jurisdiction, whoever's in charge of the voting, a registrar or an election director, they know how many mail-in ballots they have sent out to potential voters. And so if more come back than were mailed out, they're going to know that somebody tried to game the system. And there are other controls where the ballots are, you know, printed in ways with watermarks or other systems that can easily detect fraud. But Trump and his uh, consigliere, Bill Barr, they are committed to creating fear and false concerns about the security of voting by mail. Barr over the weekend went on Fox News and said right now a foreign country could print up tens of thousands of counterfeit ballots and be very hard for us to detect which was the right and which was the wrong ballot. They're lying. And finally today, Tom Frank is back. He's been a self-imposed exile working on a book that's due out next month. And he's back writing op-eds for The Guardian. This time... The headline reads, What's Behind Joe Biden's Mystique? And Tom Frank makes it clear. He's not Joe Biden's biggest fan. He said that uh, Biden stands on behalf of no great causes, just to return to the consensus days of yore. And that he wound up as the Democratic nominee because he was closer to the middle. What bipartisan centrism meant in Biden's heyday was deliberate state-sponsored cruelty on a scale so vast it is difficult to comprehend. It meant baked-in racial discrimination, imprisoning enormous numbers of our fellow citizens for using drugs, especially African-American crack users, mandatory minimum sentencing, unlimited funding for police departments, a boom in prison construction, and as it pleased Joe Biden to say on the worst of these occasions, the truth is every major crime bill since 1976 that's come out of this Congress, every minor crime bill, has had the name of the Democratic senator from Jel uh, Delaware, Joe Biden, on that bill. And Frank continues, Biden is not going to win because the old centrist strategy has worked and Republicans are fatally outmaneuvered by his clever triangulations. These days, even the Charles Koch Institute is to the left of where Biden was back in the crackdown era. And I'll note that a poll over the weekend that I saw showed that only 37 percent of Democrats who say they are voting for Joe Biden are enthusiastic about it, and most of them are voting against Trump. 
And this supports my notion that Biden is not likely to win, but Trump could lose. He could defeat himself. So later, Tom Frank says, to put it plainly, Biden is the product of a completely different world than the Ivy League meritocracy that has taken over the Democratic Party. He's an unapologetic child of an industrial town in a middle-class society. He is a relic of an older, warmer kind of liberalism. Biden uh, was upset that in 2016, Hillary Clinton's advisors told him they intended to give up on white working-class folks. And he's aware of that. Now, I was loading YouTube videos for my Sunday night music exchange, and repeatedly a Joe Biden commercial came on as the pre-roll spot, and he fumbles his lines. Now, this is a recorded commercial. I've done commercials. You record it until you get it right, even if it takes 100 takes. But he was stumbling on his words and didn't speak in a complete sentence as he begged me to chip in some cash to his campaign. (laughs) That's Joe Biden. We know Joe. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube. And I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails